Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. Together we will unearth the biggest topics in Nebraska's gardening world. Today we dive into urban wildlife. Two experts join us in studio to assist you with all your wanted and unwanted creatures and critters. You know, we humans often have a love-hate relationship with those other two-legged and four-legged critters and the slitherers that may choose to share our landscapes and our homes. Some of us want to attract all the beautiful and interesting ones, and some of us want to send the majority of them packing. So it's going to be a lot of fun today to talk about attracting and deterring urban wildlife. We've got Dave Titterington and Dennis Ferraro joining us in the studio. And you guys have also brought props. So as we That's get right. going and talk about either love it or hate it, you can mm -hmm. kind of talk about no, whether we're no. loving or hating with these things. <laughs> so Dave, if I were to start with you and say, what is your most not liked bird in particular? What would that be and why? Oh, it'd have to be some of the uh, introduced species, the invasive species such as uh, uh, a starling and house sparrow, to name two of them, and right now the, the starlings have young out of the nest already, and that noise in my backyard just drives me crazy. Plus, they're after the uh, jelly that we put out for the Orioles, so that just makes them more of a nuisance. So what's your favorite, if that's well, one of your worst? This time of year, the Neotropicals coming back because of the color, the rose-breasted grosbeaks, the Orioles, uh, the uh, warblers that we've seen moving through uh, the uh, spring and, and spring bird migration. It's hard to pick out a single bird, but uh, those colorful neotropicals, they're hard to beat. Sort of like when people ask me, what is my one favorite plant? Exactly. Say, yeah, no, I'm not answering that question. Well, we always say it's the one I'm looking at. <laughs> there you go. All right, Dennis, your turn. Your most beloved and your most detested. Well, you know, being a herpetologist, it has to be the most beloved are the amphibians, reptiles, and turtles. And I can't pick between those. It's like asking, who's your favorite child? You, you have one, but you never say it. Um, but when it comes to wildlife, I have to agree with Dave. It's the invasives uh, that shouldn't be here. And, of course, the most largest invasive is one that we don't deal with that much, and that's that primate homo sapien. <laughs> But besides that one, that invasive um, rats, uh, Norway rats, uh, house mice um, are some of the biggest invasives that we have causing problems for everybody, uh, the natives as well as everything else. When it comes to wildlife, you know, I, they all have such a great function, all those natives, that I think they all are on almost the same plane as being beneficial and necessary for the biodiversity of this planet and to keep everything together. All right, so people who want to attract birds in particular, Dave, will put all that great seed in the feeders and hang feeders all over, and then here come the four-footed creatures, oh, yeah. Dennis's creatures, <laughs> whether it's the squirrels or the raccoons or the opossums or the mice or those rats. How, how, do, you, how do you get one without the other? And you guys can bat this back and forth and see if you agree with one another. Well, it can be difficult when you're putting that feed yeah. out for birds because that feed's dropping on the ground. Uh, some of the things you can help to keep that seed off the ground is using uh, platform feeders that, that help keep the seed contained and minimizes that droppage on the ground. But, you know, uh, we clean up after our house pets, our dogs, our cats. And if you're going to attract birds to your backyard, it's probably somewhat essential that you do go out and do some maintenance and some, uh, some sanitation around the feeders. And that's, that's going to help reduce it. It's not going to eliminate the raccoons and the mice. And, you know, if there was any of those four-legged creatures you would want in your backyard, it would probably be that possum. Uh, they do very little damage. Uh, they help control ticks. One possum can help eliminate as many as 5,000 ticks in a year. Uh, they aren't the cutest animal around, but they do keep themselves very clean despite <laughs> their smell. But uh, like I say, just proper sanitation around the feeders really helps. And there we go. So <laughs> I know. I'm cute. Yeah. And, and too dead to hiss. Oh, yeah. He's been dead for a long time. <laughs> but yeah, opossums are short-lived, don't have a territory. And even though they, they may hiss and growl at you, um, I really have I've handled 
hundreds of them and never been bit. <laughs> it seems like, you know, they'll growl it and, uh, and open their teeth at you, not that you want them to do that, but, and they want to attack a chihuahua. They get scared and they well, run the other way. Well, most big dog won't attack a chihuahua. <laughs> yeah. Well, because they think anything fierce. small. They won't attack a cat or anything like yeah. that. Um, the other thing is the chances of them carrying something like rabies is extremely rare. Not impossible, but it, they're probably the least of all the mammals that we have native when it comes to possibility of transmitting something like rabies. And like they've said, they love to eat ticks mm -hmm. and <laughs> seed. And it depends. If you just want to feed the birds, I think there's a, there, there's, there is a lot of problems because the bird seed falls and that brings in voles, mm -hmm. the opossums, and about everything else. But if you want your yard to be holistic mm -hmm. and to have biodiversity, if you give a place for squirrels to feed, they're less likely to try to feed at the bird feeder. And then again, look at what you're feeding. I mean, squirrels like corn, whole corn, okay? So do pigeons. But some of the songbirds, they wouldn't go for whole corn. No. They'd rather have other seeds that squirrels don't like. And there's many seeds that you uh, market that, right, that squirrels don't like. Yeah, there's, a, uh, there's not very many birds that'll feed on corn. Um, you know, it's, it's a good de de detractor if you want to bait grackles away, they'll, right. they'll go for it. But, uh, you know, I think that's probably one of your favorites because they're also immune to snake bite, aren't they? Yeah, they're, um, they're the, of all the mammals we have in Nebraska, they're most resistant to rattlesnake bite, mm -hmm. um, being the fact that, you know, that they're marsupial. Kind of like you, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <I've>... <laughs> Not marsupial, but, you know, you I handle a lot well, of snakes. I yeah, I have a pouch. I have a pouch. I'm calling marsupial. Only, only a winter pouch, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so we're, you know, we're sort of attracting or, or not attracting. Mm -hmm. What about... We now have urban turkeys in people's yards, and we have, of course, Canada geese, and now we have mallards that are sort of puddling their way yeah. around in these little places where we've had all the rain. Are right. Positive, Dennis? Well, I'd say, I think it's positive. Yeah. Um, the whole thing is we have to realize when we have interactions with wildlife, we're building it for them or you know, we once took it away. So there's really three legs to this. You have new developments, such on, you know, the south end of Lincoln uh, and other locations where you're building into their habitat and you get a lot of encounters. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And then you have more encounters in areas like, oh, University Place around East Campus, where we finally have it built up enough and we have like a beaver pond now on East Campus and we have areas where there's water and there's denser trees. And so it went from a place that they, we devoided them and now they can come back and still hide and reproduce. We see this with fox and woodchucks. So in, it, there's two areas of towns that we're having conflicts, so to speak, or overlapping between people and animals. And there's two different reasons. One, we're taking, going into their new space that was theirs that were taken over. And the other is that we're building space in the middle of town for them. We're putting, I mean, Lincoln has more parks than most places of the same uh, per capita. And so it's great. But this also allows for corridors as we build bike routes between parks. Mm -hmm. These are animal corridors just as much as people corridors. Mm -hmm. And so we're enhancing that. And, um, you know, yes, Canada geese can cause some problems. They are protected, uh, mainly their defecation. Um, mainly mallard ducks, they, they're in pairs, and they, they'll, they'll land in your backyard and, hmm. and if you have a small pond, so. Well, we have a number of, of uh, retirement homes, uh, even at Pius, I believe, for a while in the courtyards, uh, mallards were uh, nesting in there on a regular basis. At Pershing School, they nested in, the kids had built a butterfly garden and the mallards nested there. And it was a great experience for the kids because they kind of took ownership of that family of mallards there. And, and they were only there for a short while, but sometimes you wonder about the selection of nest sites for mallards because there was one on North or South 48th Street that was trying to nest between the sidewalk and 48th Street and it's just going, oh. boy, but you know, that's, that's, that's true what Dennis is saying. I mean, it's all part of our natural community and we've kind of lost that sense of living with uh, nature that close to us. And 
um, you know, you're, you're, we, need to, we need to focus on uh, education where people can enjoy this wildlife that we have and, 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 not, uh, and be amused by it and not look at it as uh, some kind of a, a, a problem um, animal. So, um, yeah, geese can, you know, they can, they can lay a lot of droppings in a short period of time, but, you know, it's, it's more park areas and all. I don't really think geese are that prolific in backyards, but uh, we've even had wood ducks in the East Campus near area here that have uh, nested around under porches and all. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and like Dennis said, you know, we've, we've moved into their space and uh, they're just kind of acquiring some of that space back, which um, it, it does show that, that we are maintaining good habitat around Lincoln. So, okay, so this brings up the random question about turkey vultures. <laughs> oh, yes. Because the turkey vultures, of course, in the center of Lincoln, are, mm -hmm. they're fabulous to watch. They're right. not so fabulous when they regurgitate animal parts and <laughs> all over your yard. Uh, they make less mess than my neighbor's cat and dog in the yard. That's true. Um, and it's more natural. I, I like turkey vultures. Oh, yeah. Mm. I think they look cool, too. I mean, they're one of my... Well, and they and they really um, don't mind human activity being right. around human activity. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see the uh, vulture roost just down the street here, around 50th Street, and in the early morning, now they're coming over by the tall cottonwoods just north of the pecan garden. That uh, well, I think the other day I counted about 45 of them in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, they have they have an extreme purpose, and that's. Uh, when I used to work with kids, I'd ask them, I said, well, would you like to go out and clean up all the dead animals and roadkill? But, you know, uh, the vultures do a pretty good job of doing that for us, so they, they have a, a really special place in, in, uh, in our natural community. Exactly. So we're, all, we're building a lot more bioswales. We're building rain gardens. We're doing a, a better job in many urban areas of managing runoff or over-irrigation, right. those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Are those helping to attract more toads and frogs and snakes and things that eat the toads and frogs and snakes <laughs> or not? Well, what's happening, we're making it easier for these animals to adjust to our anthropogenic change of the landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were there for eons, developed with the landscape. We drastically changed it, especially with the European invasion. Now it's taken, you know, a couple hundred years, but a lot of these species are adapting because they're either, you either adapt or you die. And mm -hmm. so they're adapting to things like rain gardens, sewers. Raccoons have adapted to sewers. Most rac a lot of raccoons live in sewers. Well, they have no choice. We have no hollow trees, so they have adapted. We have forced them to adapt to things that we created. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find out, oh, the, the sewer system, storm sewer system is loaded with raccoons. Well, what did you expect? It looks like a concrete <laughs> tree to them. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, if you're watching, and if you're not, please watch us on Facebook and send us your comments and a little bit of interaction and tell us whether or not you like this kind of a discussion because we think this is both very interesting as we dig deeper and a lot of fun, depending on whether our guests sort of get going with one another here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dennis, you talk about trapping and disposing of unwanted wildlife on Backyard Farmer mm -hmm. quite a little bit. So we can refer people to that show or to our segments or to, you said, wildlife.unl.edu, right? right. Um, it's, it's a great, it's kind of a portal. It has a wildlife damage management section, mm -hmm. a conservation section. You have my guides on how to build a bat house if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a section for identification of native wildlife. And it's just wildlife.unl.edu. It's extension wildlife for you. And Dave, I know at your store, there's always what is the, the bird of the month and how you attract right. and what mm -hmm. you feed and how to, exactly. how to do all the right things too. So that information is really helpful. To but people. besides just birds, you know, that's, that's something that we've seen a real uptick in people's interest mm -hmm. in bats. Mm -hmm. um, we sell a lot of purple martin houses. We install them on properties that have martin habitat. If they don't have martin habitat, I won't sell them a house. In fact, I did an article in the old Prairie Fire News to try to educate people that if you've got a martin house but no martin habitat, 
all you're doing is attracting and breeding house sparrows to take it down. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of people in the past uh, were under the assumption that Purple Martins uh, did a good job controlling mosquitoes, but um, they've done a lot of stomach content research on Purple Martins, um, and if you think about it, a Martin, it's gonna be more efficient for a Martin to pick off a big fatty beetle in the air or a dragonfly um, than mosquitoes, plus Martins go to roost when uh, mosquitoes come out. Um, so bats are the ones that uh, do a lot more uh, control of mosquitoes as well as, as moths. But, uh, and so we've, like I say, we've seen a real uptick in people that um, are starting to learn more about bats and, and put up bat boxes and, and um, really have a little bit more enthusiasm for the creatures of the night. <laughs> Which I happen to really enjoy watching, but I know they absolutely freak people out. And that's, again, one of those things we get. Uh, it's just what people <laughs> like and what people don't like. Well, there's another animal that really isn't a rabies host. They can contract rabies, mm -hmm. but they're going to perish if they do. And most of the time when you hear somebody getting bit by a bat, it's because they found a bat on the ground and they picked it up. If you find a bat on the ground, something's wrong. You don't want to touch it. <laughs> or in your bed. Well, I get them in my bed, but, well, not my bed. I get them in my bedroom. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of urban foxes now, which uh, they're, they're just so beautiful to watch. So not as many squirrels, not as many rabbits. Mainly the rabbits are their, their number one prey. And we have a grad student who's uh, got collars or had collars on 11 uh, Lincoln foxes. And we've been test they've been testing them, and we find out that um, the significantly very low amount of diseases that they're carrying, the ones in Lincoln. Um, there's a high mortality of the young due to cars, dogs, and cats. So that's some of the data we have so far. We have a lot more data to collect. Um, but yeah, they they're seem to be doing a little bit better um, than they had been in urbanization. Um, but what will the future tell? It's hard to say. Exactly, we need to learn to be kind. So between the two of you, what's your best last piece of advice as we close out our deep dive or our deep dig tonight? Well, I'd say learning to live with urban wildlife is, is really important. Um, finding out about the, the critters that live in your backyard, not just the birds, and that's one thing that, that we really uh, pursue is, is attracting birds to your yard. But we kind of a, a full spectrum business where it's it's all all wildlife. Whether it's that antagonistic squirrel out there in your backyard you're trying to deal with, um, you know there's there's ways to deal with it without causing harm to those uh, those animals that are visiting your yard. Um, you know, and if if they're in your yard, there's a reason they're there. Um, you know, if you want to discourage them, find out what that reason is, eliminate that reason, or try to manage that reason for, for drawing them in. But um, it's just like the people that we have that uh, get kind of frustrated when they see a, a hawk take a bird off their feet, or these are woodland hawks. 90% uh, of their diet is other birds. And we try to explain to people that in, in a case like that, you know, and enjoy watching and feel honored that you're, you're watching this predator-prey relationship take place right in your backyard, because that hawk's gonna take a bird, whether it's in a city park, um, anywhere else. So, you know, there's, there's a reason for that wildlife to be around and, and you know, you, you, we need to get people to embrace it and enjoy it and, and uh, realize that uh, that's part of what we've got to protect, not just the wildlife, but that habitat that those wildlife live in. Dennis, agree with that? Yes, definitely, 100%. And I guess two big things. One, exotics, pets, should never be released and never be allowed, you know, to be, ro be roam free outdoors because they'll just cause lots of problems for everything, including diseases. So, and don't move animals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if they need to be gone, they need to be gone. Uh, call the right proper authorities, but don't translocate any wild animal into a habitat it's not from. It's a slow, agonizing death for that animal, whether it's a snake, a raccoon, or even sometimes a bird. So we don't move wildlife saying, oh, I'll bring it outside the city and it'll be fine. No, it won't. All our data shows it's a long, agonizing death if you move them out of territory. So, you know, be humane, 
uh, have them properly dealt with, but don't move them. Well, I, I can imagine what a squirrel feels like when these people trap him in their yard and take him out to Wilderness Park and let him go, and he's like in somebody else's territory. It's like Where's moving, the food? It's like <laughs> moving you to New York. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't speak the language. Exactly. No, no. You know, and on that note, enjoy sharing your space with those wildlife friends, taking care to get maximum pleasure out of the experience. I will tell you that I drove home down my driveway one day and a headless squirrel fell on the hood of my car. Well, That's hopefully that a, was an owl that got Yeah, it. yeah, so <laughs> I think it probably was. So thanks, guys, for uh, sharing your expertise. And that is all the time we do have for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch a new Digging Deeper on Facebook every Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. Central. Do not miss Backyard Farmer live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central on NET. Thanks for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer.